Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm from Silicon Valley. I actually grew up there, which is rare. Uh, most people in Silicon Valley, most startups in Silicon Valley are founded by people from outside of, outside of it. In fact, over half the founders in Silicon Valley come from outside the United States. This is a very important point. Uh, I myself have a background in ecology and economics, which means I like looking at both the big picture and then also the details and the numbers. And I'm going to talk about exponentials. Now, exponentials, it's a type of chart, it's a type of mathematics. It is not the only one out there, but like many of the other famous works of research and looking at trends in the past, understanding exponentials, like understanding epidemics, like understanding evolution, is an important part of being able to build the future. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what our exponentials give some examples of technological exponentials, show people working with it, talk about some of the challenges, and then go right into the future of the future, all in 20 minutes. So here we go. One of the reasons why I do talk about exponentials is that I had the opportunity 14 years ago to be a research analyst for Ray Kurzweil, who wrote the book The Singularity is Near. And in doing research for this and understanding and looking at exponential trends, I discovered that in many cases people, they see them, they see the technology in front of them, but they don't necessarily understand what it is that they're looking at. So for example, when people say the word exponential, sometimes they mean just it changes rapidly. So how many people here you know, use or work with not exponential technologies, but think about exponential math at some point in their life? Well, for example, almost all of you should be raising your hand because if you work with uh, compound interest, if you have a bank account, which adds a little interest on it, then, then that is an exponential. But of course, if you remember from your math class, the, the rule of 72 is that you divide 72 by the interest rate, and that get, gets you how long it doubles. So if you have a 3% interest rate, it's going to take you over 20 years per doubling. And it's, it is an exponential, but it's fairly slow. So our economies you know, double every 15 years or 20 years, which is why we live so much better now than we do 100 years ago. That is an exponential, but it's much more important to look at in technology, exponentials which are not doubling every 20 years or 10 years, they're doubling every 18 months, they're doubling every year. And so in that case, over the course of 100 years, you don't have something which is eight times larger than it was before. And again, economies are a type of exponential growth, that's a very slow exponential. No, you have technologies which over that course of time change by a million, a billion, a trillion. Now, the most famous of these exponentials is the exponentials in computing, what we call Moore's Law. And here's the very start of that, the very first chart of that done. But Moore's Law and computing are not the only exponential technologies right now. Many other technologies, technologies which have been digitized, are changing at the same fast pace, this pace which is not intuitive to us, even though we're seeing it right in front of us. So it's computing, but it's also medicine, biotechnology. It's also you know, the demonstrations that we've seen here on, on robotics, drones, artificial intelligence. All of these have characteristics of exponentiality. Now, I want to give some examples of them. Now, one thing I'd like to say, of course, about all of these exponentials that I'm talking about, all of these which are so important to us today, one of the important characteristics is that they're old technologies, right? When we're talking about artificial intelligence, when we're talking about 3D printing, we're not talking about something which is five years old. We might have learned about it five years ago, but these are all 10, 20, 30, 40 years old technologies. Now, what happens, of course, is that the idea comes out. For example, the idea of translation. We saw it in Star Trek 50 years ago. It was just a dream. Slowly but surely, people started building translation software that worked a little bit. And of course, early on, once it starts, people are saying, Here, you know, here's an article from the 80s, we'll have translation in 10 years. And still in 2012, another article that was saying, eh, we don't have it yet. So there's this long stretch of time when the technology, it's not a dream anymore, it's a little bit possible, but it's disappointing, it's slow, it doesn't quite work. And people can become cynical and say, well, if it's, we've already been waiting 20 years, we're going to have to wait another 20 years. But again, the nature of exponentials in this fast change is that it's slowly changing. It becomes less impossible, less impossible. 
finally, demonstrations come in which are now workable, usable. It's the same trend, doubling, doubling, but once it becomes workable and good, many other people start developing it, it becomes inexpensive, multiple people are competing, and then you're no longer disappointed, you're suddenly surprised by how well it's going. It was only three years ago that Microsoft and Skype announced the translation. They now have multiple languages available. Many of us are used to the idea, like I can travel to China and hold my phone up and read signs in a way that I couldn't do five or 10 years ago. That's an example of an exponential technology. Another one, of course, is robotics, humanoid robotics. And again, we dream about it, and then when we first see it, it's slow, it barely works, it's disappointing. And so you say, well, you know, it took 20 years to get this far. You know, the, the RoboCup uh, examples that children and teenagers, college students were building, it took a few years to train the robots to even find a ball, let alone to be able to kick it. But again, in this not impossible stage, suddenly they start getting good, usable. And of course, we think about this as a toy, but we do need robotics for other reasons. For example, we need humanoid robots in cases of emergencies. In Fukushima, we had brave rescuers who went into this dangerous radioactive environment to be able to turn things off, turn switches, see what things look like. Wouldn't we rather have a humanoid robot going in there? It has to be able to open doors and close doors, so it needs these capabilities. Now, at some times you have children and high schoolers and others building it for fun. You also had government projects. And as recently as 2013, the United States government, the DARPA agency, had sponsored a contest for humanoid robots that could do these activities. And if you look at these pictures, you'll see these robots are acting. They are doing their job. But you'll see that there is a tether, because if they were to fall down, you would suddenly break a five, you know, 500,000 euro value of robot, and it would not be able to get up again. And if you saw that in 2013, you'd say, well, it's not impossible, but it's still going to take another 20 years. In 2015, in June, I and 10,000 other people went to watch the next DARPA Robotics Challenge. And you know, here's one that fell over and knocked its own head off. But notice, it doesn't have a tether on it. And here are robots which are successfully picking up tools, turning a dial. In the end, several robots were able to accomplish it. They were able to do these activities. Now, it took them 50 minutes to do this, but 10,000 people were cheering as this robot slowly went up the staircase. Because since it's exponential, since it's on this trend, once it comes good enough to work in 50 minutes, then, well, it'll feel like suddenly, but it's a long trend coming. It takes 50 minutes, another doubling, it takes 20 minutes, another doubling, it takes 10 minutes, five, two, one. And then you have a robot which can move faster than a human can. And of course, we want this to exist. If you're in a disaster situation, don't you want that robot to be able to come in as quickly as possible? Now, again, with these technologies, it isn't just about the technological capability. It's also about the price and the size. We could build autonomous cars 15 years ago, but the equipment that it would take to do it, you'd have to have a truck sitting next to the car. That didn't, wouldn't make a lot of sense. But as soon as the equipment got small enough to, well, filled the entire car, but small enough to fit inside of it, then you could start going. And of course, these technologies, you know, governments were doing them, but these competitions, DARPA also did one for cars. You have college students, you have high school students who are able to build them. And it gets smaller, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, we have autonomous cars going around. Another thing about these technologies is that sometimes we forget to notice how quickly they're changing. So if you look at this picture from 1997, you're probably saying, well, that looks like a Minecraft simulation. You can't see this as being cutting edge. This used to be you know, some of the fastest supercomputers in the world doing this. Well, now when you look at the one from just even a few years ago, you can see how much it's changed. You can't even remember this picture from 1997 looking cutting edge, because we get used to it. It becomes sort of background to our lives. Another essential part of these trends is that these trends are not just about technology. They're really about the people putting them together. For example, in the case of Moore's Law, we think about Moore's Law as being a law, like gravity. No, it's a set of decisions and a set of people working together, 
you should go and check out the history, for example, some of their initial decisions were made not because they saw, you know, 40, 50 years out, but they were just desperate and not making any sales, and so they offered to sell it for less than what they were selling before. But never mind that. One of the things that we see about them is that they were, as they were putting these new technologies, the new technologies of the 1950s together, it was a group of people from different fields. They were creatively reusing existing technologies, screen printing technologies, optics, glass blowing. They didn't know what they were doing. Of course, they're, you know, they're building something new, but they're creatively reusing it, working together really well. And in doing so, they were able to create an entirely new industry. And this is important because many times when we think about technologies, we sort of think, oh, well, it's going to be designed by an expert. It's going to be designed by somebody who's been working on it for 10 years. Well, no, over and over in history, we see that new technologies and the practical application of technologies come from people who are naive, who don't really know what they're doing. Another aspect of these technologies, as I was saying earlier, is that these technologies can be old, but when they first start out, they're very expensive. And we're limited to the imagination and to the budget of the original designer. I remember seeing these little sort of personal submarines being able to go down and, you know, in a non, you know, not, not a government, but individuals being able to go around. But only if you were Jacques Cousteau did you have the opportunity to do this. So it existed all those decades ago. But now, over time again, it's not impossible to get smaller, more people are working with them. And this is just an example from a maker fair of high school students, teenagers, who are using open source software, open source hardware to be able to build robotic submarine explorers and go out and do whatever they want with it. You're not limited to the imagination of the original inventor. You're limited to the imagination of a million teenagers or a hundred million adults around the world. And I'm always going to bet on the creativity and the ideas of a million people instead of the creativity of the original inventor, no matter how smart they are. Of course, then we also we have to change our mind about what it takes to do these things. 20 years ago, if you wanted to build a satellite, if you thought about building a satellite, this is what you had. You know, a hundred million dollar satellite, a hundred, you know, 500 million euro satellite in a clean lab, and it's giant. The idea of building satellites, doing it on a Kickstarter, you know, having 600 people putting 160 euros each to be able to build this new open source, that didn't make sense to us, but this is the new reality of satellites. And again, when you think about experts, here's a graph about solar, and solar is definitely an exponential technology. The red line is what really happened. These other lines are the projections of experts, and you can see that you know, in, in the early 2000s, they saw solar as changing, and it's, it's, yes, it exists, they, they believed in it, but they, they themselves could not pick up how rapidly it was going to change. Uh, Peter Platzer, the person who started this particular project and also the CEO and founder of Spire uh, Satellites, he did research on satellites, and he discovered that the more the experts knew about satellites in the satellite market, the less they the less they understood how quickly they could be disrupted by these nanosatellites. It's, it's an interesting and important part there because our expertise is important. All of us have expertise in projects, whether we're in government and policy and NGOs and startups and corporations, and our expertise when dealing with exponential technologies can get in the way of our understanding how rapidly things can change. I'm going to give some examples now of people building with exponentials, with exponential technologies. So for example, when we look at nanosatellites, uh, two of the participants in a Singularity University summer program, they're building the hypercube system. This is hyperspectral analysis. These are satellites which go up when they're going up, they hope to launch next year, where these satellites will be taking not just sort of one spectrum, but multiple spectrum simultaneously. Now, this does not look like that clean lab that we were seeing before. This is just, well, they're now three people. They've just hired a third. But this is a team who will be dealing with the amount of data that is unimaginable. Every year, their satellites will be generating an exabyte of data. Now, go later on to look up what an exabyte of data is, but 20 years ago, an exabyte of data is what humanity generated in a year. And now, 
a team of three people will be generating that in a year. Now, of course, that amount of data can't be handled by these three people, or even if they had three million people or 300 million people. So there's going to be artificial intelligence in these satellites to be able to process and deal with this data. And what can they measure? Well, they can measure whatever can be seen, not just by the human eye, but any type of eye. So for example, here's a picture of an algae bloom in the Baltic Sea. In this sort of dangerous situation where we need to watch what's changing, well, if you want to see it right now, you have to send boats out, or you have to be a large government and, you're, and wait to take a picture. The idea that you could have a relatively inexpensive group putting it together, the idea that you could have teenagers taking, again, those open source small robots to go out and do sampling, this is a new attitude. And it isn't just one or two or three teams, it's a large number, and you'll be hearing more about space later of teams building this. Here's Planet, they already have a constellation up there. Just last month, they've reached the point where their satellites image every spot on Earth once a day. If any of you used to do remote sensing, the idea that every spot on Earth, every day, and of course, they're able to take this data, it's inexpensive because the satellites are inexpensive, and work with nonprofits and for-profits to be able to use this data. Now, of course, you might be saying, well, the satellites might be inexpensive, 150,000 euros instead of 150 million euros, but you still need you know, large government's rockets to get them up there. But even this can change. Here's one of my colleagues at Singularity University. She's an expert on social entrepreneurship, but she at times runs rocket nozzle design con contests. And people are able to do this. And of course, yes, you need supercomputers to be able to do computational fluid dynamics, but we carry supercomputers with us in our pockets. And again, when we think about earthquake monitoring, here is a group, the MySHAKE out of Berkeley, and they're using artificial intelligence to be able to discover signs of earthquakes in the cell phones that we carry with us. So that it can tell the difference between somebody riding on a cobblestone street with a cell phone in their pocket and an earthquake happening. Another example, this came out of a Singularity University program in 2011, is people seeing the large number of places where there aren't roads part or all of the year. Now, at that time, back in 2011, drones were thought of as being a weapon or a toy. But they were saying, well, now that drones are not impossible to be useful and to be built by small teams, let's, let's use this to build infrastructure. Let's use these to be able to move goods around in a country where the roads don't exist. And so they started in 2011. Now, back then, the drones were barely usable, but they saw that year by year, they'd get a little stronger, a little bit better. So they prepared for the future. They started building them in 2014. They did, did tests for being able to move uh, medical tests from a remote village to a hospital. In 2016, a similar activity. Now they're launching commercially, and not in a low-income country, but in Switzerland, working with the Swiss Post system to be able to deliver goods, medicines from one hospital to another hospital when you have a crowded street. This could be important for all of us. Now, I do want to talk about challenges in exponentials, because when we're looking at these, when we dive into the information, we can see that these exponentials have made large changes in the past. For example, how many computers do you see in this picture? Call it out. How many computers do you see here? I've heard some people say none. There's four computers in this picture, because computer used to be a job. You did computing, the way a baker is somebody who's done baking. And you know, from, from you know, 1850 here in this chart through 1940, computing was a job. Humans worked with devices. They did the computing. And then you see suddenly things starting to change. 1940s, the digitization of computers. And suddenly what was a human job became a computerized job. And we talk about the possibility of automation going into the future. And of course, there are jobs which should disappear, jobs which harm us, which are painful, which we take only because the alternative is to go hungry. But there's other jobs which are under threat of automation which people want to have. The job of radiologist, for example. You know, people do not think that they studied for 12 years in university and medical school and then their job could disappear. We do need to talk about this because 
if, if this automation happens, if it happens around the world simultaneously in many different industries, it will have the same level of change as, for example, climate change. In fact, I call it the possibility of economic climate change. But there are some differences and important things, because just like with climate change, climate change is happening on top of everything else that we're dealing with, the possibility of economic climate change is happening on top of other economic issues that we have today. You know, if you saw the movie Elysium a few years ago and they talked about the very rich looking down on the very, very poor and massive inequality, well, that was in the movie, but we can see that today. Inequality is a problem already. Could automation make that stronger? We don't know yet. And when we talk about climate change, we see the possibility of divergence from what things are, where things could go, or a very bad scenario. Well, again, with inequality in the United States, some of these changes have already started to happen. And what have we done about it already? Not necessarily very much. Now, here's some pictures of people talking about the future of jobs. Now, do you notice anything about uh, who's in these pictures? I'll tell you, it's almost entirely technologists and economists talking about it. I mean, here's people warning about it. And again, technologists, economists, investors talking about this issue. This is very important because as an economist and technologist myself, this is really important, but we're just a small number of people in the big picture of who should be talking about it. Back in the last century, when you had the digital divide, you had people who were affected by the digital divide were not participating in the conversation on it. Well, here is a picture of people talking about the future of jobs. Again, technologists, economists, in many cases, people who do not have, you know, they've never worked because the alternative was to go hungry. In comparison, when you're talking about, say, the future of the climate, well, we had Paris two years ago. We've had two more since then. It goes back, meeting after meeting, thousands of people showing up, not 200 people showing up. Now, people talk about potential solutions to the issue of the future of jobs. So, for example, they talk about universal basic income. Well, we've been doing studies for decades on them. 1970s, 2010s, the results are all very compelling. Just because you have good results, so that doesn't mean we're going to act on it. When we think about earthquakes, for example, in uh, Fukushima, one of the things that people got there, you know, we have these you know, ideas of like warnings and stuff like that. In Fukushima, they got warnings, alerts coming up, counting down 29, 28, 27, telling you when the earthquake was going to hit. Well, I live in California. I don't have an earthquake early warning system. Chileans, they don't have it. Japan has had it for over 10 years. Just because a solution exists to a really bad problem, it doesn't mean we implement it. So when we talk about solutions like UBI or any other one, just because it exists, just because it's demonstrated, we can't assume that it is going to exist unless we choose to work on it ourselves. So I want to talk about now, very quickly, the future of the future. We've got the Sustainable Development Goals. We've got really large problems. And I'd like to remind everybody here, we only have 12 years to keep our promises to solve these Sustainable Development Goals. But we are, because of exponential technologies, in a very different world. Yes, back 20 years ago, people by, affected by the digital divide were not in on the conversation about the digital divide. Because of exponential technologies, we are looking at a world where Almost everybody, if not now, then three years ago, can be in on the conversation. We are looking at a world where technologies, which previously were done by governments or large corporations, they keep on going. They get less expensive, and so you have individuals deciding to solve a problem. Here's a team saying, let's put autonomous car technology measurements into helmets. And this is not a giant corporation like Google. This is a small team of people building it with these robots that people are building slightly into the future, these robots will become the background, the infrastructure. Everybody will be able to work with them, children, teenagers, adults. These satellites that we're building, because they're so inexpensive, we can use them for purposes that we never thought previously. Here's the government of Indonesia tracking every fishing vessel, fishing illegally or not, in their waters. And they're working with Peru to be able to expand this type of activity out. 
think about it, being able to track every fishing vessel in the world. What else could we track if we decided to work on projects at this scale? Well, everything that needs to be done. Again, these are old technologies. SMS is an old technology. Databases are an old technology. But here's UNICEF using open source data to be able to allow people, for example, to register every childbirth in Nigeria, to be able to, in places like Liberia, Liberia ask adults and teenagers what's going on. So for here, for example, they're using it in Liberia to ask teenagers, does a particular crime happen in your school? You think about it 20 years ago to discover if a crime was happening, you'd do sampling, you'd ask a few people. If it was easy, you could easily hide it. Now we're living in a world where you can just, if you're worried about a crime happening, just go ahead and ask everybody, ask every teenager. One of the problems with expertise, again, going back to those earlier questions of how we expect change to happen, is that many times we think we, ne we, need, we know who needs to be in the room and who we predict is going to be in the room aren't the people who actually come and solve the problems. So when we're talking about the next few years, who can be in the room with us? Well, it can be everybody, because we're not just online, but we're online with translation software. We're not just you know, eight people deciding to come to, together to work on a new problem. We can be everybody coming together. And I'd like to close with a really important, and again, looking back at history when it talks about how we work on problems. Because 100 years ago, Marie Curie, already a Nobel Prize winner, she saw a really large problem. There was people dying in the field. And so she decided, she understood the science of x-rays, but that wasn't enough. She said, let us use this in a practical way. So she learned how to drive, she learned about car mechanics, and she was able to take x-rays and dynamos, put them together, put them on a new technology called a car, and here's her, she's driving out to the field, driving this new x-ray. And she had something very important to say about the x-ray, is that in a situation where lives are being lost and we need to work together to solve it, everybody came together to be able to make this happen. As she say, you know, here's this x-ray technology, what had seemed impossible, what had seemed difficult, became easy. The material were multiplied, personnel were multiplied. All those who did not understand gave in and accepted it. Those who did not know about it learned. Those who had been indifferent became in devoted to it. Right now, we have 12 years on working on the global grand challenges and sustainable development goals. These technologies that exist are available for all of us. If you don't understand it, to be able to learn it, if you believe it can't happen, back out of the way and let other people come and join in it together. These problems that can be solved, we can solve them together. As her example is from 100 years ago, we, all of us working together, 7 billion people, can do the same to solve the biggest, pro to solve the biggest problems in the world today. Thank you.